From the work of John Owen, the Holy Spirit in prayer. The work of the Spirit is to the mantra of prayer. The first work of the Spirit of God is the spirit of supplication in believers, is to give them an understanding of all their wants and of the supplies of grace and mercy and the promises, causing such a sense of them to dwell and abide on their minds as that. According to their measure, they are continually furnished with a mantra of prayer without which men never pray, and by which, in some sense, they pray always, for first. He alone does, and he alone is able, to give us such an understanding of our own wants, as that we may be able to make our thoughts about them known to God in prayer and supplication, and what is said concerning our wants is so likewise with respect to the whole mantra of prayer, in which we give glory to God either in requests or prayers. And this I shall manifest in some instances in which others may be reduced. First, the principal mantra of our prayers concerns faith and unbelief. So the apostles prayed in a particular manner. Lord, increase our faith. And so the poor man prayed in his distress, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. I cannot think that they ever pray aright who never pray for the pardon of unbelief, for the removal of it, and for the increase of faith. If unbelief be the greatest of sins, and if faith be the greatest of the gifts of God, we are not Christians if these things are not one principal part of the matter of our prayers. To this end we must be convinced of the nature and guilt of unbelief, as also of the nature and use of faith, nor without that conviction do we either know our own chiefest wants, or what to pray for as we ought. And that this is a special work of the Holy Ghost, our Savior expressly declares in John 16, verses 8 and 9. He will convince the world of sin, because they believe not on me. I do and must deny that any one is or can be convinced of the nature and guilt of that unbelief, either in the whole or in the remainders of it, which the gospel condemns and which is a great condemning sin under the gospel, without a special work of the Holy Ghost on his mind and soul. For unbelief, as it respects Jesus Christ, not believing in him, or not believing in him as we ought, is a sin against the gospel. And it is by the gospel alone that we may be convinced of it, and that as it is the ministration of the Spirit. Therefore, neither the light of a natural conscience, nor the law, will convince anyone of the guilt of unbelief with respect to Jesus, nor instruct them in the nature of faith in him. No innate notions of our minds, no doctrines of the moral law will reach here. And a thing to teach men to pray or to help them out in praying without a sense of unbelief or the remainders of it in its guilt and power the nature of faith with its necessity, use, and efficacy is to say to the naked and the hungry, Be ye warmed and filled, and not give them those things that are needful to the body. This, therefore, belongs to the work of the Spirit as a spirit of supplication. And let men tear and tire themselves night and day with a multitude of prayers, if a work of the Spirit of God in teaching the nature and guilt of unbelief, and the nature, efficacy, and use of faith in Christ Jesus doesn't go with it, all will be lost and perish. And yet it is marvelous to consider how little mention of these things occurs in most of those compositions which have been published to be used as forms of prayer. They are generally omitted in such endeavors as if they were things in which Christians were very little concerned. The gospel positively and frequently determines the present acceptation of men with God, or their disobedience with their future salvation and condemnation, according to their faith or unbelief. For their obedience or disobedience are infallible consequence thereon. Now, 
If things that are of the greatest importance to us, and in which all other things in our spiritual state is concerned and depend, be not a part of the subject matter of our daily prayer, why well, know not what deserves so to be. Number two, the manner of our prayer respects the deprivation of our nature and our lack on that account. The darkness and ignorance that is in our understandings, our unacquaintedness with heavenly things, and alienation from the life of God by it. The secret workings of the lusts of the mind under the shade and covert of this darkness. The stubbornness, obstinacy, and perverseness of our wills by nature, with their reluctancies to and dislikes of things spiritual, with innumerable latent guiles thence arising, all keeping the soul from a due conformity to the holiness of God, are things which believers have an especial regard to in their confessions and supplications. They know this to be their duty and find by experience that the great is concern between God and their souls, as to sin and holiness, lies in these things, and they are never more jealous over themselves than when they find their hearts least affected with them, and to give over treating with God about them, for mercy and their pardon, for grace and their removal, and the daily renovation of the image of God in them by this, is to renounce all religion and all designs of living to God. Therefore, without a knowledge, a sense, a due comprehension of these things, no man can pray as he ought, because he is unacquainted with the matter of prayer, and doesn't know what to pray for. But this knowledge we cannot attain of ourselves, nature is so corrupted as not to understand its own deprivation. Hence some absolutely deny this corruption of it, so taking away all necessity of laboring after its cure and the renovation of the image of God in us. And by this they overthrow the prayers of all believers, which the ancient church continually pressed the Pelagians with. Without a sense of these things, I must profess I understand not how any man can pray. And this knowledge, as was said, we have not of ourselves. Nature is blind and cannot see them. It is proud and will not own them. Obdurate, stupid, and is senseless of them. It is a work of the Spirit of God alone to give us a due conviction of a spiritual insight into and a sense of the concernment of these things. This I have elsewhere so fully proved as not here again to insist on it. It is not easy to conjecture how men pray or what they pray about who don't know the plague of their own hearts. Yea, this ignorance, lack of light into or conviction of the deprivation of their nature, and the remainders of it even in those that are renewed, with the fruits, consequence, and effects thereof, are the principal cause of men's barrenness in this duty, so that they can seldom go beyond what is prescribed to them, and they can thence also satisfy themselves with a set or frame of well-composed words in which they might easily discern, that their own condition and concern are not at all expressed if they were acquainted with them. I do not fix measures to other men, nor give bounds to their understandings. Only I shall take leave to profess for my own part that I cannot conceive or apprehend how any man does or can know what to pray for as he ought in the whole compass and course of that duty, who has no spiritual illumination enabling him to discern in some measure the corruption of his nature and the internal evils of his heart. If men don't judge the faculties of their souls to be depraved, their minds free from vanity, their hearts from guile and deceit, their wills from perverseness and carnality, I wonder not on what grounds they despise the prayers of others, but should do so to find real humiliation and fervency in their own. I might also add to irregularity and disorder of our affections. These, I confess, are discernible in the light of nature, and the rectifying of them, or an attempt for it, was the principal end of the old philosophy. 
But the chief respect that on this principle it had to them is that they disquiet the mind, or break forth into outward expressions in which men are defiled, or dishonored, or distressed. So far, natural light will go, and by this and the working of their consciences, as far as I know, men may be put to pray about them. But the chief deprivation of the affections lies in their aversion to things spiritual and heavenly. They are indeed sometimes ready of themselves to like things spiritual under false notions of them, and divine worship under superstitious ornaments in which respect they are the spring and life of all that devotion which is in the church of Rome, but take heavenly and spiritual things in themselves, with respect to their proper ends, and there is in all our affections as corrupted a dislike of them and aversion to them, which variously act themselves and influences our souls to vanities and disorders and all holy duties. And no man knows what it is to pray who is not exercised in supplications for mortifying, changing, and renewing of these affections as spiritually irregular. And yet is it the Spirit of God alone which discovers these things to us, and gives us a sense of our concern in them. I say the spiritual irregularity of our affections and their aversion from spiritual things is discernible in no light but that of supernatural illumination for if without that spiritual things themselves cannot be discerned as the apostle assures us they cannot first corinthians 2 verse 14 it is impossible that the disorder of our affections with respect to them should be so if we know not an object in the true nature of it we cannot know the actings of our minds towards it Therefore, although there be in our affections an innate universal aversion from spiritual things, seeing by nature we are wholly alienated from the life of God, yet can it not be discerned by us in any light but that which discovers these spiritual things themselves to us, nor can any man be made sensible of the evil and guilt of that disorder who has not a love also implanted in his heart to those things which it finds obstructed by it. Therefore, the mortification of these affections and their renovation with respect to things spiritual and heavenly, being no small part of the matter of the prayers of believers, as being a special part of their duty, they have no otherwise an acquaintance with them or sense of them, but as they receive them by light and conviction from the Spirit of God. And those who are destitute hereof must needs be strangers to the life and power of the duty of prayer itself. As it is with respect to sin, so it is with respect to God and Christ and the covenant, grace, holiness, and privileges. We have no spiritual conceptions about them, no right understanding of them, no insight into them, but what is given us by the Spirit of God. And without an acquaintance with these things, what are our prayers or what do they signify? Men without them may say unto the world's end without giving anything of glory to God, or obtaining of any advantage to their own souls. And this I place as the first part of the work of the spirit of supplication in believers, enabling them to pray according to the mind of God, which of themselves they don't know how to do, as is afterward in the place of the apostle insisted on. When this is done, when a right apprehension of sin and grace and of our concern in them is fixed on our minds, then we have in some measure the manner of prayer always in readiness, which words and expressions will easily follow, though the aid of the Holy Spirit be necessary thereunto also, as we shall afterward declare. And hence it is that the duty performed with respect to this part of the aid and assistance of the Spirit of God is of late by some, as was said, vilified and reproached. Formerly their exceptions lay all of them against some expressions or weakness of some persons in conceived prayer, which they like not. But now scorn is poured out upon a manner of prayer itself, especially the humble and deep confessions of sin 
which on the discoveries before mentioned are made in the supplications of ministers and others. The things themselves are traduced as absurd, foolish, and irrational, as all spiritual things are to some sorts of men. Neither do I see how this disagreement is capable of any reconciliation, for they who have no light to discern those respects of sin and grace which we have mentioned cannot but think it uncouth to have them continually made the matter of men's prayers. And those, on the other hand, who have received a light to them and acquaintance with them by the Spirit of God, are troubled at nothing more than that they cannot sufficiently abase themselves under a sense of them, nor in any words fully express that impression on their minds which is put on them by the Holy Ghost, nor close their desires after grace and mercy with words sufficiently significant and emphatic. And therefore this difference is irreconcilable by any but the Spirit of God himself. While it does abide, those who have respect to what is discernible in the light of nature, or of a natural conscience in their prayers, will keep themselves to general expressions and outward things, and words prepared to that purpose by themselves or others. Do we what we can to the contrary? For men will not be led beyond their own light, neither is it fit they should. And those who do receive the supplies of the Spirit in this manner will in their prayers be principally conversant about the spiritual internal concerns of their souls and sin and grace. Let others despise them and reproach them however they please. And it is in vain much to contend about these things, which are regulated not by arguments, but by principles. Men will invincibly adhere to the capacity of their light. Nothing can put it into this difference but a more plentiful effusion of the Spirit from above, which according to the promise we wait for. Secondly, we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Ghost acquaints us with the grace and mercy which are prepared in the promises of God for our relief, that the knowledge of this is necessary to enable us to direct our prayers to God in a new manner, I declared before, and I suppose it will not be denied. For what do we pray for? What do we take a prospect and design of in our supplications? What is it we desire to be made partakers of? Praying only by saying or repeating so many words of prayer, whose sense and meaning those who make use of them perhaps don't understand, is in the papacy, or so as to rest in the saying or repetition of them without a special design of obtaining some thing or things which we make known in our supplications is unworthy the disciples of Christ, indeed of rational creatures. Deal thus with thy governor, will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, Malachi 1 verse 8. Neither ruler, nor friend, nor neighbor would accept it at your hands, if we should constantly make solemn addresses to them without any special design. We must pray with our understanding, that is, understand what we pray for. And these things are no other but what God has promised, which if we are not regulated by in our supplications, we ask amiss. It is therefore indispensably necessary to pray that we should know what God has promised, or that we should have an understanding of the grace and mercy of the promises. God knows our lacks, what is good for us what is useful to us, what is necessary to bring us to the enjoyment of himself, infinitely better than we do ourselves. Yea, we know nothing of these things but what he is pleased to teach us. These are the things which he has prepared for us, as the apostle speaks in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. And what he has so prepared, he declares in the promises of the covenant. For they are the declaration of the grace and good pleasure which he has purposed in himself. And hence believers may learn what is good for them and what is wanting to them in the promises, more clearly and certainly than by any other means whatever. From them, therefore, do we learn what to pray for as we ought. And this is another reason why men are so barren in their supplications. They know not what to pray for, 
but are forced to betake themselves to a confused repetition of the same requests, namely their ignorance of the promises of God and the grace exhibited in them. Our inquiry, therefore, is by what way or means we come to an acquaintance with these promises, which all believers have in some measure, some more full and distinct than others, but all in a useful sufficiency. And this, we say, is by the Spirit of God, without whose aid and assistance we can neither understand them, nor what is contained in them. I do confess that some, by frequent reading of the Scripture, by only the help of a faithful memory, may be able to express in their prayers the promises of God, without any spiritual acquaintance with the grace of them, in which they administer to others and not to themselves. But this remembrance of words or expressions belongs not to the special work of the Holy Ghost in supplying the hearts and minds of believers with the matter of prayer. But this is that which he does herein. He opens their eyes. He gives an understanding. He enlightens their minds so that they shall perceive the things that are of God prepared for them and that are contained in the promises of the gospel and represents them therein in their beauty, glory, suitableness, and desirableness to their souls. He makes them to see Christ in them and all the fruits of his mediation in them all the effect of the grace and love of God in them, the excellency of mercy and pardon of grace and holiness, of a new heart with principles, dispositions, inclinations, and actings, all as they are proposed in the truth and faithfulness of God. Now when the mind and heart is continually filled with an understanding and due apprehension of these things, it is always furnished with a mantra of prayer and praise to God, which persons make use of according as they have actual assistance and utterance given to them. And whereas this Holy Spirit, together with the knowledge of them, does also implant a love to them upon the minds of believers, they are not only hereby directed what to pray for, but are excited and stirred up to seek after the enjoyment of them with ardent affections and earnest endeavors, which is to pray. And although among those on whose hearts these things are not implanted, some may, as was before observed, make an appearance of it by expressing in prayer the words of the promises of God retained in their memories, yet for the most part they are not able themselves to pray in any tolerable, useful manner, and to either wonder at or despise those that are so enabled. But it may be said that where there is any defect in this, it may be easily supplied. For if men are not acquainted with the promises of God themselves in the manner before described, and so don't know what they ought to pray for, others who have the understanding of them may compose prayers for their use, according to their apprehensions of the mind of God in them, which they may read. And so have the matter of prayer always in a readiness, I answer, I do not know that anyone has a command or promise of assistance to make or compose prayers to be said or read by others as their prayers, and therefore I expect no great matter from what any one shall do in that kind. The spirit of grace and supplication is promised, as I have proved, to enable us to pray, not to enable us to make or compose prayers for others. Number two. It savors of some unacquaintance with the promises of God and the duty of prayer to imagine that the mantra of them, so as to suit the various conditions of believers, can be pent up in any one form of man's devising. Much of what we are to pray about may be in general and doctrinally comprised in a form of words, as they are in the Lord's Prayer, which gives directions and a boundary to our requests but that the things themselves should be prepared and suited to the condition and wants of them that are to pray is a fond imagination. Number three. There is a vast difference between an objective proposal of good things to be prayed for to the consideration of them that are to pray, which men may do, and the implanting an acquaintance with them and love to them upon the mind and heart, which is a work of the Holy Ghost. Number four, 
When things are so prepared and cast into a form of prayer, those by whom such forms are used do no more understand them than if they had never been cast into such form, unless the Spirit of God give them an understanding of them, which the form itself is no sanctified means to, and where that is done there is no need of it. Number 5. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to give to believers such a comprehension of promised grace and mercy as that they may constantly apply their minds to that or those things in a special manner which are suited to their present daily wants and occasions with the frame and dispositions of their souls and spirit. This is that which gives spiritual beauty and order to the duty of prayer, namely the suiting of wants and supplies of a thankful disposition and praises, of love and admiration to the excellencies of God in Christ and by the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. But when a person is made to pray by his directory for things, though good in themselves, yet not suited to his present state, frame, inclination, wants, and desires, there is a spiritual confusion and disorder and nothing else. Again, what we have spoken concerning the promises must also be applied to all the precepts or commands of God. These in like manner are the matter of our prayers, both as to confession and supplication. And without a right understanding of them, we can perform no part of this duty as we ought. This is evident in their apprehension who, repeating the words of the Decalogue, do subjoin their acknowledgments of a want of mercy, with respect to the transgression of them, I suppose, and their desires to have their hearts inclined to keep the law. But the law with all the commands of God are spiritual and inward, with whose true sense and importance in their extent and latitude we cannot have a useful acquaintance but by the enlightening, instructing efficacy of the grace of the Spirit. And where this is, the mind is greatly supplied with the true matter of prayer. For when the soul has learned the spirituality and holiness of the law, its extent to the inward frame and disposition of our hearts, as well as our outward actions, and its requiring absolute holiness, rectitude, and conformity to God at all times and in all things, then it sees and learns its own discrepancy from it and coming short of it. Even then, when as to outward acts and duties, it is unblameable. And from this comes those confessions of sin and the best and most holy believers, which they who don't understand these things deride and scorn. By this means, therefore, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray by supplying us with the due and proper manner of supplications, even by acquainting us and affecting our hearts with the spirituality of the command, and our coming short of it in our dispositions and frequent inordinate actings of our minds and affections. He who is instructed herein will, on all occasions, be prepared with a fullness of matter, for confession and humiliation is also with a sense of that grace and mercy which we stand in need of with respect to the obedience required of us. Thirdly, he alone guides and directs believers to pray or ask for anything in order to the right and proper ends, for there is nothing so excellent in itself, so useful to us, so acceptable to God, as a matter of prayer but it may be vitiated, corrupted, and prayer itself be rendered vain by an application of it to false or mistaken ends. And that, in this case, we are relieved by the Holy Ghost, is plain in a text under consideration for helping our infirmities and teaching us what to pray for as we ought. He makes intercession for us according to God. That is his mind or his will, Romans 8:27. Augustine says he does it in us and by us, or enables us so to do. For the Spirit himself without us has no office to be performed immediately towards God, nor any nature inferior to the divine in which he might intercede. 
The whole of any such work with respect to us is incumbent on Christ. He alone in his own person performs what is to be done with God for us. What the Spirit does, he does in and by us. He therefore directs and enables us to make supplications according to the mind of God. And herein God is said to know the mind of the Spirit, that is, his end and design in a manner of his requests. This God knows, that is, approves and accepts of. So it is the Spirit of God who directs us as to the design and end of our prayers that they may find acceptance with God. But yet there may be, and I believe there is, more in that expression, God knows the mind of the Spirit, for he works such high, holy, spiritual desires and designs in the minds of believers in their supplications as God alone knows and understands in their full extent and latitude that of ourselves we are apt to fail and mistake, has been declared from James 4.3. I won't insist on particulars here, but only mention two general ends of prayer which the Holy Spirit keeps the minds of believers to in all their requests, where he has furnished them with a matter of them according to the mind of God. For he does not only make intercession in them according to the mind of God with respect to the matter of their requests, but also with respect to the end which they aim at, that it may be accepted with him. He guides them, therefore, to design, number one, that all the success of their petitions and prayers may have an immediate tendency to the glory of God. It is alone he who enables them to subordinate all their desires to God's glory. Without his special aid and assistance, we should aim at only self, and ultimately in all we do. Our own profit, ease, satisfaction, mercies, peace, and deliverance would be the end in which we should direct all our supplications, in which they would all be vitiated and become abominable. Number two, he keeps them to this also, that the issue of their supplications may be the improvement of holiness in them, and by this their conformity to God, with their nearer access to him. Where these ends are not, the matter of prayer may be good and according to the word of God, and yet our prayers an abomination. We may pray for mercy and grace and the best promised fruits of the love of God, and yet for lack of these ends find no acceptance in our supplications. To keep us to them is his work, because it consists in casting out all self-ends and aims, bringing all natural desires to a subordination to God which he works in us, if he works in us anything at all. And this is the first part of the work of the Spirit towards believers, is the Spirit of grace and supplication. He furnishes and fills their minds with a manner of prayer, teaching them by this what to pray for as they ought. And where this is not worked in them in some measure and degree, there is no praying according to the mind of God.